When Tristan, our firstborn, was old enough to enjoy stories, I began a tradition of telling her about a little girl named Tristan and her friend Barney, a giraffe who wore striped overalls and could magically transport the two of them to any place, real or imagined. And the Tristan in the, all the Tristan in the stories had to do was hold Barney's hand and say, please take us to Axe. And off they went. And in the imaginary stories, Barney and Tristan went to known parks and other places that we frequented, but also to storylands and places we would just make up. As the stories began to wind down, Barney and Tristan stopped someplace for ice cream. And Barney always ordered vanilla ice cream, which he topped off with lots and lots of ketchup. <laughs> and while the stories were fantastical, they always had the truthful theme of Tristan being loved, and the world being full of wonder and awe. Indeed, as we sat in reality, engrossed in the stories, those moments my daughter and I had were themselves filled with love and awe and wonder. And another amazing thing about the Barney and Tristan stories was watching our lovely wide-eyed preschooler in rapture without disbelief as each adventure unfolded. And it wasn't that Tristan was unable to discern the real world from the one we shared in the Barney story. She, she could. It's that she gladly and instantaneously set aside disbelief in order to imagine inhabiting the fantasy world before her mind's eye. She became a, a willing bystander following the intrepid pair wherever they wandered on their adventure. And as we had other children, they heard similar stories and wandered in their mind's eye on fantasy adventures, too. Adults often think that only children do this hopping out of reality stuff. But actually, most of us do something similar when we read fiction, turn on a TV show, watch movies, or see a play. Probably don't think about it, but when we listen to stories or read a book or view a show, we set reality a little to the side so we can enter the world depicted in the story so that we can perceive what's going on. We even do this with nonfiction. I love nonfiction, and a good biographer invites me to hop in and imagine their subject's world unfold. In stories, real or imagined, the human mind sort of partially teleports out of reality and into the narrative. As stories unfold on pages, screens, or stages, they unfold in our minds. Provided nothing jars us back to reality, we willingly participate in the story as if we were a character, like a fly on the wall, or better yet, an unseen spirit watching. And so while we may in reality be sitting in our living room or a theater, a part of our mind hovers in the story where we accept the not presently really happening world as, well, presently happening. It's pretty cool. The stage actors are even trained to understand the audience as a character participating in the scene. The play's done right, the audience buys in, transport themselves in as bystanders right into the scenes. In theater, we call it the willing suspension of disbelief. And that idea goes way back to Aristotle, who long ago grasped the theater audience, set aside critical thinking about whether a story was real or not, and agreed to pretend that it was. If a stage production is done well, within a few minutes, the audience hops into the story until it's over, or they are jarred back to reality. Can't put it down. Books are like that too. We buy into the fiction or the non fiction story so well that we don't want to come out of it. And while adults can and do willingly suspend disbelief, things can stop us more so than they can with children. Modern adults in the West are particularly prone to apply science and historical accuracy to stories that children do not. Apply. Consequently, we have a, a tendency to reject stories that do not appear to be fact 
base, factual accuracy is among the things that keep us getting into the story or jar us out of the story, destroying the suspension of disbelief. And the sad thing is, is historicity and science dogmatically applied can keep us from a lot of good and meaningful stories, all of which leads me to today's lesson on the transfiguration of Christ. When it and the rest of the Gospel of Matthew were written, the type of historicity and science modern adults commonly use today as lenses for stories were nowhere to be found. In the pre-Enlightenment era, people did not typically approach Bible stories insisting that the contents add up in what we might call a scientific way. Empirical proof, as we have come to understand it, was not the be-all, end-all of truth. And some specific truths in the context of Jesus' era that are relevant to our lesson this morning include that Old Testament story taught that Moses was said to have spoken to God in a cloud, that Moses met God on a mountain, and that Moses experienced luminous transfiguration himself when given the law which he brought off the mountain. Truth in Matthew's context included that Moses and Elijah were both rejected by people yet vindicated by God and both were said to have not died but to have been taken directly to heaven. Truth in Matthew's context included that Elijah was to return before the Messiah arrived. Truth in Matthew's context included that a vision, as Jesus calls the event, could be a dream or trance that revealed, revealed supernatural appearances and revelations in something other than a moment that can be filmed had cameras been available. And all of these images and symbols and revelations of truth are in the reading today because Jesus, for Christians, was envisioned like them. So prophets and God met Jesus on a mountain. God appeared in a bright cloud and spoke to Jesus' followers. Jesus is transfigured and glowing. And then Jesus comes off the mountain like the new Moses, like the new law, as the Messiah and as Son of God. And by the time that Matthew was written, Jesus was also said to have ascended to heaven. And those truths about how Jesus was experienced by Matthew's community are accurate. And they are accurate whether the story is understood as fact or as fiction or as a mixture of both or as Jesus in the story calls it vision. Any insistence that literalism, historicity, or science applied to the vision misses the truth in the story, which is the long-held truth in Christianity, that Jesus is the decisive revelation of God to whom Christians are to listen. Or as God in the transfiguration of vision puts it, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And note that this ultimate truth told by God to Jesus follows his three parts. Jesus is God's beloved son. God is well pleased with Jesus and we are to listen to Jesus. And there's not a word spoken by God in his vision about beliefs and literalism inerrancy, or even belief in Jesus, whatever that means. There's nothing suggested, his, suggesting historicity and science apply or are needed to find the truth. The truth that Christians are to take away from the story is that Jesus came down to his followers as the new Moses, the new law, the Messiah, Son of God. And no matter how we come to this story, the truth for Jesus' followers is that Jesus is God's beloved Son with whom God is well pleased and we are to listen to Him. And this lines up beautifully with the age-old truth that for Christians Jesus is the decisive revelation of God. What He tells us we are to listen to. And I find 
great comfort in that because what Jesus is recorded as saying, whether we think it is fiction, non-fiction, or a mixture of both, all of it, if we listen, is about well-being. If we listen to what Jesus says, we can give and get well-being. It's all about peace on earth, goodwill to all. And I've summarized how this before, that, that what I hear Jesus say when, when we listen is that, that God is love, that we are to believe in love, that we are to love love, and that we are to be love. And I hear that without concern about whether the stories about Jesus and his teachings are literal, scientific, or historical. I experience the stories to be poetic and parabolic. And such experiences have led me to personally believe that summary is decisive truth, that God is love, that we are to believe in love. We are to love love and to be love. And I find that truth full of love and wonder and awe. And, and I love that the images in our lesson are mystical, picking up the wonder and awe part with spirits of great prophets and a bright shining Jesus and a bright misty cloud providing the voice of God, validating Jesus. This religious stuff we do always has elements of mystery to it. Our very existence, life, has a mystical side. Creation and the Creator love. They're all experience shrouded in a mysterious cloud that nonetheless speaks to us. And we can follow that voice because it speaks to the depths of our being as Christians. It tells us Jesus is the Son of God. It tells us to listen to Jesus. And when we listen, we sense Jesus speaking in and to the depths of our being. And what Jesus speaks reveals truth to us. Decisive truth. And sadly, the decisive truth revealed by Jesus in the Bible can okay, get all knocked out of whack when people started to insist that the Bible stories were meant to be records of historical events, which caused others to insist then that they are false records when science and historicity are applied. And in these debates, science, history, and the Bible are misused by both sides. The Bible does not insist it is to be read literally true and inerrant. Science and historicity are not meant for measuring truth in Bible stories in an empirical evidence sort of way. And yet, we hear people insist the Bible is a record of events that everyone must read as literally true historic facts. And in response, we hear science and historicity applying to that literalism to show the Bible is not history or science, and so it's untrue. And no one has to agree with me, but I see both sides as off base. Nothing in the Bible was written in the context of the Enlightenment where science and historicity measure truth. Nothing in the Bible claims it is an affidavit from God of cold, hard facts. Indeed, the truth is, the Bible stories were all created in times and places untethered to science and historicity for expressions of truth. Truth was understood to exist in symbol and metaphor, and in blended mixtures of them with facts. And we modern folks allow this sort of truth in poems, songs, fiction stories, and even in depicted stories of history. But a lot of us balk at, at it in Bible stories because people keep treating them as written to be purely factual accounts when they are not. Bible stories often mix history and metaphors and people and parables. And you know what? It doesn't really matter whether the story took place in a way they could be videotaped today or if it is all fiction or if it is all a mixture of fact and fiction. What matters is do the stories help us find truth? Can they help us experience love, wonder, awe? In today's lesson undoubtedly seems fantastical, yet taken in the context of Matthew, we can find it full of love, wonder, and awe. And I'm going to close by reading our lesson again, and as I do, 
I'm going to suggest we keep in mind Matthew's context that Jesus is understood to be like a radiant new Moses and the new law. And that Elijah came back in the vision before Jesus becomes the Messiah. And keep in mind too that God appears in, in a cloud like he did to Moses. He tells us who Jesus is to Christians. And most importantly, what Christians need to do. Finally, willingly suspend belief as I reread Matthew 17, 1-9. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking and then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Truth and the Gospel of Matthew. One more thing. The Son of Man was raised so we can tell everyone about this vision. We can tell them what Peter, James, and John heard the truth of God's very own assertion that Jesus is God's beloved Son, that God is well pleased with Jesus, and we are to listen to Jesus. Amen.